me, can you tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do? I'm a bitch. Um, I'm a streamer. I'm Swedenita, and I have Tourette's syndrome. And again, can you, when I ask you a question, can you answer about this camera here? So okay, just so. stare at this little orange, this little orange tab. Okay. Um, so, and you know, how long have you had Tourette's? I actually had noticeable ticks before I was speaking. So probably at least since the age of one or two. Um, weirdly, I would not stop saying Michael Schiesmacher. I have no idea why, but I'd also wolf whistle, so I'd quite often go <whistles> and it was so clear and loud that nobody thought it was me because I was a toddler. So people thought it was my mum and they'd think she was hitting on them. So yeah, she was like, could you stop doing that? Because uh, big burly builder men and stuff would come and hit on her when she didn't want them to. <laughs> and then throughout your childhood, um, you were having it. What was that like as a child? Um, really confusing and difficult. I mean, it wasn't as hard as when I was an adult because people expect you to have self-control. You say silly things as a kid and people don't really think too much of it. But I did swear a lot and um, people did raise an eyebrow at my parents because of it. But uh, 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 f*** off. It was, it was pretty much not that much of a problem until I got old enough that people started to be like, why is this still happening? So probably until I was about 13, it wasn't that big of a deal. So did no one at that point think that something might be wrong? No, I mean, uh, uh, I had quite an unconventional past. I was home educated, my mom was disabled and quite often spent long periods of time in bed. And so no one was really minding me. If anything, I was taking care of my mom and it didn't really leave much scope for people to notice anything different about me. We had pre periods of homelessness and, you know, there were times I lived in a tree house with a bunch of hippies and they were very open minded. So even if I behaved in a way that was different, nobody really questioned it. And there wasn't really that much of a problem until I tried to go into conventional schooling. So ha! when I started to try real school, I had a lot of barriers. I couldn't explain while I was talking, just shouting over the teachers. I um, quite often insulted other students and it kind of all ended with me being beaten unconscious by a bunch of sixth formers when I was about 12 or 13. And I was like, well, there's no point getting an education if you're not gonna have a future to use it in. So I ended up going back into home education after that. I'm just going to go into some of the things you said there. Mm -hmm. And you, you talked about um, you went through a period of, of homelessness. What, what happened there? My mom was really sick and she couldn't pay for. Oh, sorry. I figure that's probably going to make a bit of noise. Yeah. <laughs> My mom was really sick and we didn't have much support from the rest of my family. So uh, when she couldn't get out of bed and she couldn't really function, no one was paying the bills. Bailiffs would come over and I came up with all kinds of tactics to keep my stuff, like painting my TV with nail varnish to make it worthless and things like that. And eventually it just got too much and we had nowhere to go. I mean, I had periods of on and off of homelessness and it certainly teaches you a lot about managing the world and people um, but yeah it was mainly just because it's pretty much impossible to get a job when you don't know when you're going to spank someone or shout something racist. Cool, so what we're going to do now is just mm -hmm. some close-ups and we're going to use some water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're going to get some uh, close-ups and then some shots for um, Instagram. <sighs> I did used to live with my family before we, me and my mom moved away and um, they used to punish me so horribly for my tics because they thought it was attention seeking. So um, when I broke my arm, I screamed once because it was bent in the middle and they, um, my stepmom was like, it's not broken, she's just attention seeking, she does it all the time. And they almost didn't take me to the hospital. And when I did go to the hospital, the doctor gave me this little card from, and there were smiley faces on it. And one of them was a happy face and on the other end was a crying face. And there was just like a face in the middle with like a line in it. And they kind of were a gradient going from one side to the other. And um, he was like, point to the face that you feel, cause I was little. And I looked at my, my stepmom and she was like, don't you dare me confess sort of face. And I was like, uh. So I pointed to the middle one and they almost didn't x-ray me. Um, but they were like, just to be safe. It's, she's probably fine. 
but just to be safe. And after the x-ray, they're like, yep, your kid's a tank. Um, and yeah, I had lots of situations like that. I would go be sent to bed without any dinner so many times because I couldn't sit still and behave at the dinner table. Um, and I would do things that just looked like so bratty. Like I'd be eating and I'd be really enjoying it and then I'd just smack them all across the table and they'd be like, what the fuck? So I ended up in that situation, ha, a lot. And it was awkward and scary and I was embarrassment and I didn't get to go to put, like family things with them. I didn't really know how to explain myself. I didn't know there was a word for what I was. And I had, I eventually had heard of Tourette syndrome, but I had such a stereotype in my head of what it was that I never thought that that could apply to me. So um, it took me a long time to get a diagnosis as well, because as a kid, even, I went to, huh, I went to the doctor al alone because my mom was so ill. And um, I was like, my arm keeps doing this thing and I'm not asking it to. And sometimes I say stuff I don't mean to. And the doctor was like, do you hear voices? I was like, no. Do you think you have magical powers? No. Do you see things that aren't there? No. Um, and so they're like, well, you, you know, you seem like you've got a perfectly functional mind. You're probably just attention seeking and you'll grow out of it. And I got told this about three or four times and it was really frustrating. And I felt really afraid to engage her with people because I thought they'd think I was attention seeking and I thought they'd autom automatically hate me. So I was terrified of interacting with people after that. You know what I need to do now is to, no. I, want you, I want you to look at your lap mm -hmm. and I want you to lift your head up and look into the lens mm -hmm. and stare at it for about five to 10 seconds. Okay, so put your head down. Okay. And then I'll count you in three, two, one. So my stereotype of Tourette syndrome was that it was only swear words, that you always shouted them, and um, that they were just the same repeated ones. It couldn't ever be in context, that it couldn't ever be complex. And the things that I was doing when I was alone were complex. Sometimes I'd sit there and I'd just go, I killed 52,000 men. And that doesn't seem to fit with the idea of someone just shouting one random word over and over. And so because it seemed so complex and sometimes even situational, sometimes even a punchline I'd never have the wit to come up with myself, I thought it couldn't be Tourette's. Um, but that's all completely wrong. And even though my kind of Tourette's is very rare, um, it's definitely a stereotype of Tourette's if, by, by a medical standard, if not by a societal standard. It can be incredibly lonely and stagnating. I felt like I had no future. I had no idea where I was going to go, what I was going to be. I didn't feel like I had any control over my life. And it didn't seem like that was ever going to change. I was incredibly depressed. I ended up depressed for 13 years. I was not only socially phobic, but also socially inept. I was really awkward and terrified of people. Um, never liked to even make eye contact. That was terrifying. Mm -hmm. Was that something that was during your this the period of depression you were going through? So I started self-harming as a way to cope with everything that I was going through, and it was a lot. It wasn't just to, it wasn't just Tourette syndrome. It was intermittent homelessness. It was my family punishing me for tics. It was you know all sorts of things. But that all started when I was about eight or nine, and I didn't think that anyone would ever know that I did it. Um, and I don't mind talking about it because I'm not ashamed. Though that was me not finding the best coping mechanism, but still coping. And I managed to cope with a lot more than most people can cope with. And that is just evidence that I can handle it and that I got through it and survived it. In the end, I found healthier ways of coping, but nobody shows you that when you're nine. So this was what I did. And yeah, luckily, don't do it anymore. It took quite a few years to get over it and figure out better ways. But yeah, like I said, I'm not ashamed that I got through it. Were your family worried about you at that point? Mm, I didn't really interact with most of my family. It was just me and my mum. And my mum had plenty going on. She was pretty distracted at the time. So it was just me dealing with it. The funny thing about uh, 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 dealing with anger alone as a child is that if you learn that no matter how much you smash, no matter how much you rage or scream, no one cares and no one's coming, you start to bury the rage and detach from it. And that can be really weird because 
If you disengage from your anger and you don't address it, you lose all hope that things can change. Because anger is a hopeful emotion. It's when you don't stand for how things are and you want them to be better. And if you lose that, it can be very defeating and it can be very depressing. In my early 20s, I was like, I've had enough. Uh, this is definitely involuntary. This is definitely not attention seeking. I do it when I'm alone. I know it's not about other people. And I went to the hospital and I was like, I really need this diagnosed. I want a life. Uh, and uh, they did some tests. They gathered my pee for an entire week. I had to pee in the same jar for a week. And I didn't have anywhere to live at the time. So I was sleeping on someone's couch. And I was like, that's not apple juice. Don't touch it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, that's how I got diagnosed finally. But they diagnosed me initially and didn't get around to telling me for five years. So I ended up being about 27 when I finally got the piece of paper that says you have Tourette's syndrome and my life started. And I got a job. I got an explanation and I got friends and everything started for me because the minute an involuntary and offensive action has an explanation, people can connect with you and relate to you. And then, well, so once you got the diagnosis and once you know you know you've got Tourette's, mm -hmm. what, um, what did it change in your life? What's the main thing it changed? Oh, I shed so much guilt. So much guilt. <sighs> Uh, it was devastating to see that I kept hurting people's feelings and people kept pushing me away and, uh, ah, people kept, people kept, kept judging me and I kept hurting the people around me that I really cared about. Even my mom, I used to pinch her on the back of the arm as a tick. It got me kicked off a bus once because I did it to a stranger. And then whilst that person got up to tell the bus driver, I did it to another person. So I got kicked off and I was spent, I spent like, oh God knows how long. It was hours and hours and hours and hours trying to find my way back home. I think that happened when I was like 13. So yeah, uh, after I got my diagnosis, it felt like it wasn't my fault and there was no amount of therapy and there was no amount of like restraint and there was no amount of anything that could have prevented that from happening and it wasn't because of me and it wasn't because I was a terrible person, which was really freeing. Like I felt like I'd been carrying all this guilt because I just didn't know how to make it stop. Being able to explain what's going on helps you to connect with people who might otherwise write you off as crazy or think that you hate them. And because some of my tics are violent, it's so important to me for people to understand that that's not intentional. At first I was just, I used to gather sea glass to de-stress and I sold that online so I didn't have to interact with people. I saved that up and used the money from that to buy craft supplies and I was selling craft supplies when I was, you know, I, I rented a couple of offices, I started to build on that and it started to grow and I felt really great. But then I tried streaming for the first time. I used to play a game called Overwatch online on the PC. And the reason why I did that was because I discovered push to talk. You hold down the button, you speak, you lift it up, no one can hear you. Oh my God, for the first time people knew me before they knew I had Tourette's. I got talking to this guy and he's got, I've got, he said, I've got a confession to make. I'm streaming. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I don't care. Um, so he dropped me a link. And his chat was like, this is a voice actor, a streamer or a soundboard. That, that is what this person is. And the reason why is because I can imitate a lot of things that I hear. I have echolalia. It means that if I hear a sound, sometimes it triggers a tick and it's to play back that exact sound. It means that I can imitate a lot of the game characters because they say the same thing over and over again and it triggers me. And so because I was able to mimic them, they thought voice actor, soundboard or streamer, one of the three, gotta be. And they were hunting for me, but I wasn't there. I didn't have an online presence. I barely even had a Facebook back then. And so, yeah, I thought if I can be these things without even trying, maybe I should give it a go. And now I've been all three. Um, and the thing with that is, is I, if I hadn't bumped into that, into that specific dude, I probably never would have gotten started. Um, and it was completely unintentional. I didn't know enough about streaming for me to have any expectations that it would go anywhere. I thought a big streamer was someone with a hundred viewers. And I think the most I've ever had looking at me at once is about, oh, about 30,000. <laughs> So yeah, um, big, big skip from what I expected to what actually happened. Yes, it's live and lots of people are very angry that it's live. They're like, you can't help what you say. You say things that are very hurtful. Um, what if people don't wanna hear these hurtful things? How could you force that on them? Go on a delay. 
And so I kind of felt like, no, I'm just going to do what I want and act like I'm everyone else, equal to everyone else, and have every right to interact with people the same way everyone else does, until Twitch bans me, which is what I expected to happen. I have the N-word tick, unfortunately. That is a no-no. I put in the title of pretty much everything I create online that I have Tourette syndrome. No one's hearing any of this against their will. They are warned. And the thing with that is, as well, not only are they warned, but context matters. So if swear words in and of themselves are so terrible that nobody should ever have to hear them and anything that contains them should be banned, we have to ban the dictionary and Wikipedia. Context matters. It's so obvious. And because I'm not trying to denigrate anyone or hurt anyone, the reason I've been let off is to allow access for people with disabilities. That doesn't mean that Twitch is also going to allow racism. So yes, context matters. And that's why I'm still here. And I'm really glad that the platform has the clarity to recognize that and let me be a part of all this. There's a, 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 a lot more acceptance than I expected. And that the internet isn't this cesspit that everyone else makes it out to be. There's a lot of really lovely people out there really eager to support and help each other. And yeah, I'm really glad I found that out. When you look at, um, when you think back to 15, teen teenage year old, teenage um, Anita, mm -hmm. and then you think about the fact that you said you were seen by 30,000 people mm -hmm. on Twitch, <laughs> how does that make you feel about how far you've come? I don't know. I would have never expected it. I would have never thought it was possible. Uh, this is not where I expected to be. We're going to make some shots of your hands now. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, and if you just focus on, see the way, just keep them there, and I can see the way you were kind of slightly pulsing your hands <laughs> there. We're just going to get some shots of your hands pulsing, because we get that to cut away too, essentially. So if you just move your hands a little bit. I'm trying not to think about it now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay, and then, so what, this, what are the most common ticks you have? Oh, for me, uh, mostly winking and whistling, unfortunately. Uh, it's fine in public because most people tend to ignore it. In clubs, it's another story. Um, the amount of people who've got chatting to me and bought me drinks and I've been like, wow, people are so nice here. And they've gone, don't take this the wrong way, but do you have Tourette's? I want to go, yeah. They're like, oh, and you see like the realization and that she's not into, she wasn't beckoning me over. I'm dumb. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it's m m mostly okay for those two. I flip, I flip off a lot of people, I, I raise my middle finger to pretty much everyone. Babies, adults, old people, drivers. Uh, the worst one is it's mostly triggered by people letting me cross the road. If some car pulls over and lets me cross the road, I do this at them. And <laughs> I also make wanking gestures, unfortunately, as if I'm a dude. Um, there are actually clips of me doing it um, on Pornhub. And they've gotten so many views. And it's not me who's put them there. Some random dude has clipped me making that gesture um, and put it on Pornhub and it's actually gotten more views than some of my YouTube videos. There should be a word for Tourette's fetish because it's definitely a thing and it's creepy. It's not cool. Like when people, are, I find them really sexy and it's like, I'm finding an exit now. Like the, it's, 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 I, I've never had trouble attracting people. And I even get propositioned in the street after people have watched me for a while, shouting at cans of tomatoes and things. And so for some reason or another, it doesn't repel people as much as I'd like. Um, and I like both men and women, so I have had relationships with both, and it's never had any kind of deterrent effect on either. Uh, I've had stalkers ever since I was young, um, uh, like that's happened to me every now and again. Some people just get a bit too friendly, you know, and don't let it go. But since I've been streaming, I had, I've had a few people stalk me and try to figure out where I live and things like that, and not really been very successful. Um, one guy in particular found out where I lived and started camping in my back garden, started following me in the streets. Um, he assaulted me and I reported to the police and they did nothing and he would spend hours knocking on my door. Um, he would fall asleep in my front garden. He'd watch my house day and night. He'd stand out there in the rain watching my house, waiting for me to come outside. Um, when the police went to detain him, when I reported him one time, they found him on the way to my house with a knife. And he made constant threats while I was streaming that he was going to kill me on stream, that he was going to be there in five minutes and do it for everyone to see. 
and it took a long time for the police to do very, very little. And I felt like I was completely on my own, no matter how much footage I took, no matter how much I submitted the messages and the threats and the hate and the harassment. Uh, it went on for so long before the police ever even gave him a restraining order. What has threats taught you about yourself? Mm, breakfast. My breakfast cereal. Um, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Uh, it's frustrating because my ticks tend to be smarter than me. They're capable of quite a lot of things that I'm not. Um, they have great delivery on one-liners and jokes that I just don't have and couldn't match up to. And sometimes it takes me a couple of seconds to figure out the joke and laugh at it with everyone else. So yeah, um, I guess it, my ticks have a better sense of humor than me and faster reflexes than me. Um, I can react to things as a tick much faster than I would have intentionally. Uh, do you have methods to control your ticks? Mm, I whistle a lot. Pause there, sorry, just let that, that annoying biker pass by. Oh. There we go, okay. Is there, do you have any ways, any like kind of ways you've got to control your ticks? Uh, yeah, I whistle. So it helps me in the bathroom a lot because there's a difference between whistling a tune, which people don't seem to mind or even mention, um, or shouting, I can hear you shitting. So, yes, uh, whistling has saved me in a lot of situations. You're suddenly f walking behind a bunch of school kids. And, um, yeah, it gives me a lot of control. What, what do you whistle? What, do you whistle a particular tune or is it just... Oh, I, I can whistle anything. Anything that gets stuck in my head, really. I, I whistle a lot of game songs, because I'm a gamer. But I whistle all sorts of tunes. Studio Ghibli tunes and classical and just anything. Um, Bobby Farron and just, yeah, anything. And... Uh, it's so much better than offending people. Waiting for trains, people, like, <laughs> I put my coffee cup down for a second and whistled while I checked my phone, and I looked up and there was money in the coffee cup because I was whistling. I love echoey places because it makes whistling sound amazing. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's how I cope, and I do it a lot. I don't really start most of my day as whistling. That much practice, you must be amazing at whistling. I guess that's subjective. <laughs> <laughs> you said, um... I'll kill you. Tourette's, um, means you burn more calories. Oh yeah, I definitely burn more calories. Uh, I have, like, a little chicken wing goes up and down, like, all the time, and, like, you expend a lot of mental energy. Um, so Tourette's, a lot of people don't know, I have mental tics as well as verbal tics, so you're not hearing all of my tics sometimes. Uh, I, it's, if you could imagine trying to remember a phone number or doing complicated math while someone's shouting loads of random like numbers at you, that is what it's like. I, my, it's really hard to focus, it's really hard to maintain a certain train of thought, and so you expend a lot of mental energy just trying to focus on anything. But also, you get kind of, uh, you get you get uh, a lot more movement in your day-to-day, -day. Um, so your body's doing all sorts of things. Um, just aside from what you would actively choose to do. And so, uh, yeah, there are days where I eat a lot of food, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, and I didn't realize how many extra calories I was eating until I started tracking it. So I eat, uh, yeah, sometimes between 3,000 and 6,000 calories in a day. Not every day, some days are fine, but yeah, that can be the case. That must be incredibly frustrating to be, for something to be happening that you can't control and not, can it make you almost angry with yourself? I was never angry with myself. I noticed very early on that the more frustrated I was with it or the more I anticipated it and worried about it, the more often it happened and the more likely it would be the most self-sabotaging kind of tick. Thing is, if you worry about doing something, it's very likely to become a tick and start happening more often. Which has got me in a lot of hot water, actually. Can you give us an example of the hot water you got into? Mm, yeah, I've, um... Oh, I have, I have so many examples, it's unreal. I've thrown orange juice across the shop and smashed it on the wall. I've um, shouted racial slurs in a toilet cubicle and come out and been surrounded by black women and been like, oh, oh no. Um, you know, I've shouted and stuck my middle finger up at so many people, especially drivers. I nearly caused a car crash in a taxi because I shouted cats. Cats is one of my longest ticks. I had it ever since I was little. Um, it started as caterpillar and then for some reason got abbreviated to cats along the way. And unfortunately, if you shout cat in a, in, when someone's driving, they slam the brakes. And so we almost had an accident. And now, whenever I get in a taxi, 
off, I end up having to say, hi, I have Tourette's syndrome. If I shout cats, don't slam the brakes. If I offer you a fisting, don't try to take me up on the offer. And usually people take that really well and it's a conversation star. Whereas if I say nothing, then bad things can end up happening because of the misunderstanding. There were certain situations where it didn't happen and I didn't know why. When I interact with animals, when I'm caring for someone, I don't tick as much. When I whistle, I don't tick at all. And when I, you know, when I focus and fixate on something without distraction, the ticks go away. It gives me a lot of control. A lot of people with Tourette's syndrome, they can make music or they can do something that really engages them mentally. I have a friend who has Tourette's. He punches himself in the face a lot, unfortunately. Put camera in his hand and he's fine. And you wouldn't know he has any ticks at all. Um, so he does photography to help him and it's become his job. The thing is, Weirdly, if something becomes a respite from having the condition, you tend to do it a lot. And that means that we often end up with unexpected talents and most of them are creative. You'll find a lot of singers and artists with Tourette's syndrome because it tends to engage the mind in just the right way. Weirdly, um, maybe I shouldn't bring this up, but I'm good at it anyway. Um, sex is one of those things. Um, and a lot of people who have Tourette's tend to report that they have fewer ticks or none during sex. But the thing about that is, that's because it engages your focus. So that only applies to good sex, um, which is really f***ing brutal. Because I've never hurt a guy's ego more than simply going during an intimate moment. Um, and I have had ticks. Like, I, I, I punched a dude in the dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Do you know pre when you you said when you get into a taxi you pre warn the the taxi driver? Mm -hmm. Are there any other places where you pre warn? Mm. Customer service, if I can, doesn't always work. Um, with customer service, if I go to a foreign call center, not a lot of other people and not other countries are very aware of Tourette's syndrome, and they think they don't care until it starts happening, and then they don't understand anyway. Um, so yeah, the customer service, taxis, what else? Just anywhere where I have to speak to anyone for a long period of time, really. Not being neurotypical gives you a different perspective. It's really good for evolution to have lots of different kinds of brain. And neurodensity, like lots of um, interconnected areas of the brain, um, cause things like autism, Tourette's syndrome, OCD, and what's the other one, ADHD. These are kind of non-neurotypical people and you can find a lot of talent in them. Not just creatively for people with Tourette's syndrome, but things like having impeccable memory as someone with autism. This isn't a disadvantage or a disability, it's just a different perspective. And it's given me a lot of advantages as well. So I don't see it as a flaw to correct. I see it as an opportunity to contribute from a different avenue than everyone else. So I'm not trying to fix myself. and I'm not crying over the fact that there's no cure. I'm not looking for a cure. I'm not trying to work against myself. I kind of see myself as a triangle in a world full of circle slots. And everyone thinks I'm gonna try and fit through them like everybody else does. But if I trim off my corners, I don't become a circle. I'm, I'm less than a circle. So I'm gonna use my edges the best that I can. Are you proud? Mm. I think I've got a little way more to go before I'll be proud, but I'm pretty content and that's enough. So is there anything that you want to say that we haven't covered? Mm, f off. Nope, can't think of anything. <whistles> Scuffed.
Sure. What do you want to hear? Uh, let's see. 